All right, take number two, guys. We're back. Dylan has returned. We tried recording this for a split second, and then we had some feedback issues. We are trying again. But just to get people caught up before we get into today's podcast and talk about what we're going to do, they've probably been wondering, Dylan, where have you been at? What's been going on with you, man? Why did you disappear? Yeah, so I had a really, uh, I had a hell of a month this past month. I had surgery on my septum in my nose, and they also did another procedure called a turbinectomy that kind of clears out some other some space so I can just breathe better, quit keeping my wife up with my snoring and whatnot. And um, I had a complication from the surgery that caused my throat to swell up. It was from the um, sort of the really severe post nasal drip of the blood and whatnot going down my throat while I was still healing up in the, in the days following the surgery, but it got so bad, uh, like nine out of 10 pain that I had a hard time sleeping. I was getting maybe three hours cumulatively of sleep on a daily basis. And I had a really hard time eating, drinking, spent the subsequent Saturday in the ER, getting you know some fluids and writing some tests on my throat to try to determine what was going on. But I'm happy to be back. Uh, I'm back to eating normally, training normally, and now back on the podcast. Dude, we're excited to have you back. I'm going to attempt to timestamp this for everyone. I can't promise this will work. It's too hard to go through after and find all the, the time points. But we're happy to have Dylan back. He actually did go through the ringer, guys. He was like fucked for about a week and a half, two weeks. Really bad. Yeah. Had no sleep. I felt really bad for him. So we are returning, though. Uh, today's podcast is going to be awesome. So what we're going to be discussing is external and internal cueing, some new research, a meta-analysis where they took a look at long-term strength effects of external cueing and if that's beneficial. Um, and we're also going to be talking about what the difference between external and internal cueing are and all sorts of different things there. Um, we're also going to be referring to um, a couple things with programming. So one thing me and Dylan are actually both doing with our own programming currently is incorporating a little bit more maximal single practice to get our, our um, you know, max strength back up. And a lot of people have questions as to how to program this. So we're going to be going over uh, quite a bit with just including skill practice within the, the paradigms of your programming. Uh, and then also we have some really cool questions on the Q&A today. So one question was, what are some ideas that we believe in that are not supported by science or go against science? And the second question is, what are some things that we've significantly changed our minds on over the years? So pretty excited to get into today's topics. But first off, we'll dive in actually to um, the, the science of the day. So mass as always is where we pull most of our scientific literature from. And really we're cheating because we're getting the breakdown straight from Greg and the guys over at mass. They make it very easy for us. And I think it's something all of you at home listening should sign up for. We're not affiliated, but it's very, very useful. And I like to give credit where credit is due because they're doing all the legwork for us. Now, one of the articles Greg published, from mass was uh, he was talking about a meta analysis they just did on external cueing or what they'll sometimes in the literature refer to as external attentional focus. So what this means, if you don't know the difference between say external cueing or internal cueing or what those are in general is external cueing is when you give an athlete who is performing exercises, a desired outcome or task for them to try to orchestrate better form and technique or some kind of uh, outcome. So for instance, if you're deadlifting, you might tell an athlete for an external cue, leg press the floor away from you or press your legs as hard as you can into the floor, something along those lines to give the athlete some realization and thought as to how they should be creating, say, leg drive. An internal cue is from sensory feedback. So internal cues are sensations we try to feel or sense, or can even be something like your buddy grabbing your lats and say a lat pull down while you're performing a lat pull down, your buddy's holding your lats. So you create a proprioceptive feedback or awareness of those lats and you're able to actually train them greater. So what we know from individual studies is that internal cueing really helps with muscle growth. And there seems to be some slight effects on strength gain, but it's mostly uh, related to muscle growth. And then external cueing seems really um, good at helping short-term strength development, but they weren't sure about long-term strength development. And what this meta-analysis that Greg covered in mass really showed was basically they had an inclusion criteria that um, allowed about seven to eight studies in. I think it was seven or eight. I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, what an inclusion criteria is really quickly, whenever they do a meta-analysis, they have to come up with some parameters to ensure that the studies are all looking at similar outcomes and doing similar things with the design to kind of more or less say, hey, these studies are reliable and they're going to be able to create um, some kind of 
inference that makes sense from including all these together. That way, one's not testing very different parameters than, say, the other. And so what they found after looking at long-term and short-term strength gains is that external cueing definitely seems to help with strength output and development. So acutely, we see strength measures rise pretty significantly uh, to the point of statistical significance, uh, meaning within the session itself. Long term, technically, the effect size were the same, but it didn't reach statistical significance. However, they did do a sub analysis, which is kind of like a secondary analysis of the meta analysis on the lower body lifts and exercises, and they found those did reach statistical significance. So it's worth noting that these studies that were looking at external cueing on short-term and long-term strength development were basically looking at things like a mid-thigh pole, which is kind of like a rack pole or a block pole, a squat and a deadlift. There's even some hand grip strength work in there where they're like squeezing a, a grip tester. So there's a lot of different strength specific tasks but by no means were any of them like not related to the barbell. The problem with a lot of studies in the past is they were athletically driven. So something like playing tennis or basketball, and they didn't incorporate things like powerlifting. What was cool about this meta-analysis is it looked at a lot of things where people are actually on a barbell. So that's kind of what the meta-analysis showed. But I think what me and Dylan want to talk about really is external cueing and internal cueing and our thoughts with it. And the first topic I have written down here is what is the general difference between internal and external cueing outcome for sensory? And, and really, is there actually as much of a difference as we might think? I'm going to kind of give what I think, but Dylan, you can kind of, you know, also explain your take and stuff too. Absolutely. I actually think internal and external cueing blend together over the course of like, say, a, a training cycle. But that's something I can get to. Um, but kind of what are your thoughts on just the study and, you know, internal and external cueing? Yeah, so... I definitely lean towards more external cueing for the majority of my lifters, especially when you're talking about enhancing technique in a particular exercise. Um, and, and we're talking like SPD work right here, compound lifts. Uh, for something that's more of like an, an isolation type movement, I do lean more heavily towards internal cueing. Um, for example, if I had someone doing like a, a dumbbell incline bicep curl, or something like that. It's going to be really effective to just think about just feeling that stretch and that contraction purely in the bicep, right? But if I'm teaching someone how to squat better, I'm going to teach them to push the floor away from them, right? I'm not going to tell them to uh, just try to feel their quads extending their knees, right? Because that uh, is not going to be as, as productive in getting them to become a more efficient squatter, uh, whereas maybe if they're doing a leg extension, it, it may be useful there. So I think that there comes a time and a place for both of them. And as you mentioned, they do start to blend together at a certain point and they're, uh, you know, they're, they're just different tools. So it's not that one is necessarily better than the others and the other. Uh, and I think that although the study was not able to show long-term strength development from that external cueing, I had go out on a limb and say that it's, it's definitely going to be there. If you go and talk to any very advanced or elite lifter, they're more than likely focusing on very simplistic external cues when it comes to how they execute those, those movements. You know, when I walk out of squat, all I think about is feeling even in my feet. And once I feel even in my feet, I'm ready to pull the trigger and take it to depth. And once I hit depth, all I do is think about pushing the floor away and standing up. Right. I'm not thinking about internal cues as I do that. And in fact, if I were thinking about internal cues, my performance would most likely decline. Yeah. And I think this is really where uh, we have to get specific. And this is actually a problem in the literature, too, is that sometimes when we talk about internal cueing or internal uh, attentional focus, uh, they, they kind of change from one research paper to the other, the definition. So I think it's, it's very important that I give kind of my hard definition of these. So to me, internal cueing is really just sensory feedback. It's really like feeling something happening. Now, what I would argue, and I know you're going to agree with this right away, but that when you learn an external cue or even refine it, say you've already learned this, but you're refining it in a training cycle because your deadlift's been feeling off and you're like reminding yourself, oh yeah, this is what it feels like to pull the slack out. So, so what you do is you usually start with an external cue for the first few weeks of like getting something down. And then eventually it becomes an internal cue because you stop cueing the, I guess, 
motion of it, but you start to ensure you're feeling it while you're doing it. So for instance, when I pull Slack, the first few weeks when I'm refining it, and I recently did this, I was really focused on bending the bar to the ceiling. That's an external cue, bend the bar to the ceiling and then wedge. And after I got that down for a few weeks and my Slack pull started to kind of normalize and became almost automated, then I start to uh, rely on the sensory feedback of feeling that. So feeling what it feels like to have that stretch and tension in my hamstrings, feeling that sensory feedback. So some people would argue though, that is not technically an internal cue. I would argue that that's not technically an internal cue. Yeah, but the thing is, in in the research, they use this in a lot of the studies, including some of the ones they um, were looking at, where they usually differ is internal cueing for like muscle growth. So they have a bunch of studies on that. And I think that's really what we're kind of getting at. But but at, at the end of the day, an external cue always starts with like perform this action. And then to me, like internal cueing is some kind of sensory feedback. Um, so I guess, you know, if we're arguing that, but I, I will say this in my paradigm of creating this, I would say you have to start external always, and then it leads to internal. You can never really do it the other way around in most cases, because if you start with internal and you really don't know what movement you're trying to orchestrate, you really don't know if you're doing it correctly, so to say. I, it depends on the movement, like using a bicep curl, like simply thinking about feeling your biceps is going to enhance your ability to do a bicep curl for the development of the, of the biceps, right? So yeah, but say you give someone the pin the shoulder blades back while they're doing the incline, right? And, and they don't know how to do that. A bit more, you know, yeah. things yeah. like that. But no, yeah, I'm, with, I, I totally I'm with you. On, I'm with you on that. Um, but I'll say that for you to internalize what it feels like to pull the slack out is more you, you, you aren't necessarily cueing yourself as much as you, because you don't need, you don't need to, you, you have, essentially automated the task of, of pulling the slack and wedging in. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, so it's, it's, that's, that's very different than having a lifter who is trouble, troubleshooting an issue or struggling with, with how to wedge in and, um, and, and, and cueing that, that, okay, feel that stretch in the hamstrings, feel this, feel that. Um, I agree. We would start external and then it can, it can move internal or it can start external and it can just become internalized and it can become automated. And that's ultimately the goal for, for any cue. You know, I think a lot of people spend time, they spend time thinking, what cue do I need to think about? What list of cues do I need to think about? And the real answer is you want to use as little as possible to get the desired outcome. You don't want to be going through a checklist in your head. And the more you're thinking about, the, the lower your performance is most likely going to be. It's like the Andre Malenchev quote, if you're thinking, you're not lifting. Yes. And that's so, okay, this is the perfect time to, I, I, I think modern powerlifting, really just the modernity of like, I don't know, we'll call it like periodization and programming and stuff has really led people to believe it's as straightforward as what's written on the paper. So what I mean by that is if someone sees deadlift, uh, you know, one set of five at RP eight and they know they're deep in the off season, they're not hitting anything near maximal singles or whatever. And they got like 12 weeks to peak. They oftentimes will see that and just think I need to just lift as heavy as possible and just move the weight where oftentimes we should be entering new training cycles where it's a little bit higher volume, a little bit lighter weights. Um, and, and maybe you even have some structured singles programmed in there, but you know, you're nowhere near peaked out strength or anything, and we need to be focusing on new cueing. And so the way I really view a training cycle is the beginning of it should be a refinement phase. That's whenever we have our group coaching programs are always 16 weeks long. The first eight weeks are really a work capacity, hypertrophy and technical refinement phase. Yeah. And you do the same kind of thing. And so it's like you spend eight weeks preparing your tissues to handle volume. So you know, kind of lighter weights, higher volumes, improving that work capacity and improving your ability to move well on the bar. And you're going to probably be thinking a little bit more, at least on some days during this yes. phase implementing those cues then you get to the last eight weeks you should be locked in by then if you're not you need to find a way even if things aren't perfect last thing you want to do is take a one rm where you're like okay grip grip the bar okay set the shoulders okay ribs down like if you're doing that before a one rm good fucking luck so i've got uh, two things on that that come to mind i know before you and i talked about um when we would take someone into a peaking block when they weren't going into a meet and you lean towards always pushing towards, you know, heavy singles by the end of that training cycle, because, because you were saying, well, why not? Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas sometimes I might top someone out at a triple at a nine 
and then cycle back to that technical refinement and work capacity phase because I've seen enough. I'm like, all right, I know where this is going. I understand where the top end strength is indicated, but I see these issues that I don't want to spend another month waiting to fix. Yeah. See, yeah. I have a I have a slightly different approach. The way I look at it is progress, not perfection. I know you do to some extent too, but I kind of I what one thing I'll say is I'm a stickler for letting my athletes like I'm not kidding. I've started a training block with athletes multiple times. They're kind of half-assing it, not implementing the cues, they're being lazy, they're being overzealous. <laughs> no, no, you never do this. You're a good athlete. No, 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 you don't do this. And and so, but these guys, I'll literally, we'll get through the block. I'm like, we're restarting the training cycle because you yeah. didn't implement anything and there's no point of going forward. So I will say I'm like a huge stickler. And so I tend to never get past that phase really where I'm seeing anything too egregious. And I also will get to the point too where I'm, I'm happy enough. Like I know they're not going to be an expert squatter in one cycle or two cycles under me or whatever. And so I'm happy enough to let them pull the trigger on those, those one RMs. But I will agree though. Uh, and, and I think really the essence is I, I look at that like Milanichev don't think you're not lifting, right? Like I look at that as part of the process of developing powerlifting. So I look at it as like, okay, we have to go through that phase at some point too. But I think I'm just a little bit more stringent on like letting my athletes get there. I can kind of be a drill sergeant these days. Like I've, I've kind of had to pull it back a little bit with some of my guys because I realize I'm like, you're not doing your fucking shit. We're restarting. It's like, yeah. again, you know, that like strength and conditioning coaches yelling at him. It's like the movie scene from Miracle where they're doing the <laughs> sprints back and forth down the ice. And he's like, again. You know, the, the second thing that came to mind, how many times have you had a lifter leave coaching oh, while yeah. they're in that first eight weeks? Well, while they're in that phase of, hey, we need to bring up your work capacity. We need to go through some technical <laughs> refinement, right? Yep. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm not setting PRs right now. I don't yep. feel strong because they're thinking of their way through these things. You've mm -hmm. given them new cues to think about. Now they feel like they're not producing, you know, optimal you know, weight on the bar and performance in the gym but they can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. They, they just fail to realize that if you go through that phase, you bring that work capacity up, you refine your technical capabilities, become a fucking technician with your lifts. Yeah. And then guess what? Now that strength phase and that peaking phase is going to be money after that. Dude. And it's so funny, the night and day difference for my athletes who fully give into that process. And then the yeah. ones who kind of do, but like they still stick around. I, you're straight up, right? Like I've had, I had one guy who just left because I kept saying he was squatting high. And then I finally just gave him a cheeky joke because I was just like, at this point, there's no point in me even correcting it. So I was like, these, these squats are, I, I said, these squats are high as balls. And I, I thought it was funny. I, at that point I was just like, I'm laughing about it. He got really bent out of shape and cut. And later he actually apologized a little bit, but like, I just thought it was funny. Cause I'm just like, I've told you 10 fucking times. Like we can't be squatting like this, but it's really an emotional investment sometimes. And I understand it. Cause I've, I've made these mistakes too. It's not that I'm above it. It's just, you know, as coaches, our job is to give you results and we can't just lie and, and hold your hand through some bullshit. Like we got to tell you, Hey, you got to take a step back and work on this, work on that. Yeah. I think we don't conceptualize enough the difference between peak strength and I guess like other forms of strength. Like sometimes I, I even think of my PRs as like, oh, wow, now I can take 600 pounds and think through technical cues while I'm lifting this. Like in a way, that's a PR to me as where previously 600 pounds required me to not think like I couldn't think about new so cues. blackout and lift it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so there's, there's, there's so much more nuance and complexity to this than just like what's hard written on a paper. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now real quickly, uh, how do our, our cues change over time? I think this is something, and what I mean by this, in case you don't understand, um, is, is I have found that my cues start to develop over time and they, they, sometimes I come back to cues. Sometimes I create completely new cues. Like for instance, a good example of this is when I first started squatting, I was really focused on opening up my hips and that, that worked for a while. Um, because when I entered the gym for the first day, my knees were about as forward as they could possibly be, which it didn't align with my anatomy at all. But that's how I was told to squat. Cause like everyone NASM textbook was like, Oh, you got to squat completely knees forward, you know? And, um, so eventually I worked on certain cues, like external rotation of the hip, you know, basic bracing things. And then after a while you start to develop your strength in certain muscle groups and certain movement 
I guess we'll call them dominances. I always call them strength dominances. And you kind of have to redesign your cues. And for a while, then I actually started to cue more, a little bit more hip internal rotation, knees really forward. When I was heavier, I would squat wider. Uh, now that I've lost weight, I actually squat a little bit narrower and rely a little bit more on a balance and stretch reflex. And so these cues can kind of change over time. And I think this is something no one really talks about. Um, but even like I've even noticed sometimes I'll have to change my cues based on how fatigued something is. So my low back's just smoke because I'm throwing it through the ringer on deadlifts and good mornings and all these exercises. I'm going to squat a little differently than if my low back's feeling fresh. And so I think this is something no one really talks about. But um, I guess for you, like wh- how have your cues kind of changed over the course of your like training or or how do you even approach that with your own athletes? So the first question, how, did, how have they changed across my own training? I, I would say that um, similarly, you know, as I've, I've lost body fat over the years and, and built muscle, built more muscle mass, you know, my ability to move in certain positions has, has changed um, not for better or worse, but simply like, you know, how you said you were squatting a little wider and now you, now that you're leaner, you're squatting a little more narrow, um, relying on that stretch reflex a little bit more. I've encountered some similar things there, uh, but I'll say that uh, for me, my, my cueing has just been whittled away. I, I try to think less. I try to focus on like one thing, like on squats and deads, I feel foot pressure and I push the floor away. Now, granted, I'm a sumo deadlifter. Um, my sumo, my sumo position, if you, if you like transpose that over my squat, from a direct side view, they're not entirely dissimilar. The, the sumo is almost like a partial range versus the squat. And of course I'm pulling a bar off the floor, but my cueing there is, is pretty similar there. Granted, my sumo is a little wider stance, of course, but uh, my goal there is to, to literally just think less um, on the bench press. I squeeze the shit out of the bar and I drive in hard with my legs and I, I focus very little on feeling too much else. Um, everything else kind of falls into place, but that's just because I've been doing it for a really, really long time. And I just have internalized all of those things that I need to do as far as lat tension, um, you know, and, and maintaining external rotation of the shoulder, et cetera. Do you ever find for me, I find I'm the same way. So you get to a point and I think this is, I would hope this is obvious to most people. And I would hope this is something most people are aiming for, but you get to a point where you've mastered most cues. But what I found, especially for me, and this might be an independent individual thing, but I heavily need to usually return to some form of a cue or recreate it a little bit. So like I'll have scap retraction and chest to bar and certain things like that down in the bench, but I'll kind of forget how much to internally rotate my grip and like outside palm pressure or something like that. Right. And so I'll have to spend a a beginning of a cycle remembering that and feeling it again, because it almost gets washed away a little bit through that, like uh, amalgamation of all the cues coming together. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, So I find I have to revisit them. Like, honestly, probably once a cycle, like at least one small thing, nothing major, but yeah. and, And what you're talking about is just kind of spot treating little issues with cues. But I think that uh, I mentioned, way, I mentioned it earlier that, you know, lifters think like, what cues do I need? And then like, they're just like, furiously writing down notes on like 15 cues to think about the next time they bench press. Yeah. And then, and then they're like, Hey, like this feels horrible, right? Because they're thinking their way through it. Uh, the goal is not to think about cues constantly. Cues are tools to help you move a little bit better. But it, once you internalize the ability to move well without that, and you basically put it on autopilot, that's the end goal. The end goal is to literally just, just do the movement and not have to think your way through it. And that's when you know that you are, and you have become a very technically proficient lifter. And, and it's not to say that that lifter isn't going to think about any cues, but the list of things they think about is going to be far shorter than what a beginner or even an intermediate lifter would be thinking about at that point. Yeah, um, definitely agreed. As far as how, go ahead. I was going to talk about how it changed for my lift. Things Mm -hmm. changed for my lifters. Um, I'd say that for more novice lifters, they're definitely going to get more cueing. I'm always going to explain that their performance is going to decline for a brief period while they're thinking their way through it. There's no way around it, right? If you tell if you tell anyone to think about, you know. Let's say uh, you got a batter and and someone's throwing a baseball at him and you say, okay, like look at the ball, hit the ball. They're going to do far worse. I believe there was a study on exactly that where where their their ability to hit the ball went down. 
Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing if you're taking someone out of, uh, you know, really poor positions, um, a poor understanding of how they need to move their body underneath a load. But once they start to progress, I always try to say, okay, we need to whittle away at what you're thinking about. And I know that there may be, you know, these two other three issues, but this is the one thing I want you to think about during your next session. This is the main thing, the big ticket yep. item. Yep. And I just want you to focus on nailing that because chances are, if you nail that, those other two, three issues, they're going to clean up if not go away. Yeah, I agree. I think it's one at a time always. No, not always, but most of the time. If it's a really small change, I'll give yeah a couple things. But generally speaking, yeah. it's like that one goal per session to focus on. And <clears throat> excuse me, I think that's that's really key with long like long term technical change comes from step by step by step, and it's it's always getting refined. I I think I think of it maybe then a little bit or maybe not maybe it's just the way we're expressing it's different but i do tend to think of it as a chronic chronic um building up and breaking down process mm -hmm. i just think of like when it's an advanced lifter the amount you build up and break down is a lot less so for instance like for me i'm not going to completely redesign my squat from the ground up um but i am going to always kind of redesign it like every time i come back to a new training cycle because let's say for instance yeah. i was doing a training cycle where i was really getting a lot out of front squats my quad awareness strength and knee position might be amazing but my hips kind of get a little dormant that was what happened to me a few months ago i realized like i was just not hinging my hips as much which was weird for me because i used to be so posterior dominant and then i kind of it dawned on me i've been doing so much front squatting and high bar squatting that i almost like forgot and oh yeah i got to use my glutes a little bit in this low yeah. bar you know what i mean and so little things like that i'm always building up tearing down and kind of readdressing what i think we could work on but I, I, more or less that's what you're saying right yeah yeah absolutely i'm just saying that um, i try to explain to my lifters that we are not trying to keep this list of cues forever. Yes. We're yeah. trying to use them as we go. And as soon as one is no longer serving you or you don't need it, we need to eliminate it from your mind. Just internalize that, put that, put that little thing on autopilot and move on from there. Have you noticed that? Cause I don't know if, so I know this one coach, his name's Mark. He's a buddy of mine. This guy's really good at coming up with some very creative, um, verbiage behind his cues like he can really get some people to be like oh that makes sense i'm so <laughs> simple with that shit like i'm just like yo push the floor like take your leg and admittedly it's a drawback as a coach but i i've realized there's just kind of two kinds of lifters with cueing there's the ones who understand conceptual ideas a little bit better like broader more like oh okay you're trying to achieve this and then there's some who need a very specific pinpoint it's kind of like the difference between viewing something through like a floodlight versus like a spotlight that's very pinpoint some mm -hmm. people really require that like acute like okay when you push the floor away drive your big toe into the ground or whatever it's going to be or 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 some fancy like concoction of words to achieve it have you noticed that with your lifters that they kind of go one way or the other with that well i think that this just plays into the idea that cue needs to be individual and you need yeah. to make sure that that cue clicks with that person i can say bananas and if it gets you to deadlift better <laughs> then it's a fucking good cue you know what I mean? yeah, yeah. Um, i mean some people just want to be a little more precise some people are uh, cool with the more generalized cueing it's just something you need to tease out when you're when you're actually working with someone and making sure that your athletes understand that they can come to you and say hey that doesn't make sense to me, or I, I don't really get that. Can you explain a little bit better? I would run into this issue with Lindsay, my wife, a lot. And, uh, you know, she'd say, oh, well, that cue doesn't work for me, you know? Yeah. And and it would be on something that, like, it's not – and I would have to explain that it's, it's not always – because she would say this a lot about a lot of different cues that I would give her. Um, and – I said, you have to also, as the athlete, put in some work on trying to understand what this means. Yes. Yeah. Right. So like, because I can't just speak words to you and then you move better. There yeah. has to be that, that moment where you process the words I'm speaking and you try to understand what does that mean? What does it feel like to push the floor away? Yeah. Right. What does that even mean? Right. And then I remember, um, he specifically on like pushing floor away on like a sumo deadlift for her. And I'd had her doing a lot of leg pressing in, in recent times. And I was like, leg press the floor away. Yeah. And she was like, 
boom, just push the floor away. She, and I remember the day that she was like, holy shit, like, look at this. And she had filmed it. She was like, this looks like a real sumo. Like, this is a good looking sumo. And, that's, I, that's and I was exactly. like, what did you do? And she was like, I leg pressed the floor away. And I was like, that's what I've been saying for like 10 years. <laughs> that's exactly what I mean. So, so some people can get the general, like to me, leg press or push the floor away is zero difference. Yeah. The, 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 it's like the grander outcome of that task makes conceptual sense to me. Yeah. There's some really need like that to me, that's like calling on her memory of the leg press, you know what I mean? And so she's going to some like visceral memory of like what that feels like. And then using that like old memory of sensory input to like concoct that into the movement. It yeah. So it was a, to- it was a day. Daniel Sun, Mr. Miyagi moment yeah, yeah. <laughs> where he finally understood why he was being told wax on, wax off. Yeah. yeah why to yeah, paint yeah. up and down. <laughs> <laughs> totally. But that, that's kind of what I'm getting at. It's like, you've got to put like, don't just expect a cue to do the work for you. Like put in some time with it, actually understand it, learn it, you know, um, don't just fire back to your coach. Hey, that doesn't work. You know yes. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, they're yeah. like part of it's the coach meeting the athlete, but part of it's the athlete understanding that they don't know what they're doing. And that's why they hired a coach in the first place. And they need to start to try to learn, Hey, like unpack this statement. Like, why is my coach telling me this? What, what am I supposed to be doing? And, and don't expect it to just click in a session. Absolutely. I, there are cues I think- that I've, that I've heard that didn't click for like a few years. And then I was, I had that light bulb moment where I just had that stellar session. I was like, Oh my God. That's what that's supposed to be like, you know? Yeah. And I I think too, um, sometimes like cueing can go a little too like, like, like the, the one cue I've always disliked. And I think we've talked about this is I don't like the bend the bar cue with on bench press. Now um, I think, Oh, if I recall right, you kind of meet in the middle on this one, but the reason I don't like bend the bars for most people, they literally try to bend the bar and it caused them to over tuck that elbows. And sometimes that can lead to a net outcome. Good. But oftentimes it gives them the wrong understanding. So to me, I always want to stress like, no pack your shoulders that will set your elbows into the right trajectory. But it's, that's a lot harder to understand than something more simplistic. So sometimes that simplistic might be the route and then you correct further from there. But explaining, I, if I cue someone bend the bar, I I'm going to explain to them that they need to create that external rotation from the shoulder. And that simply doing this is not bending the bar. Simply rotating the wrist is not bending the bar. I totally get what you're saying, but right. then I would just argue why even keep the bend the bar in there? Why not just tell them, hey, with your shoulder? Do because you I bench 500 right pounds, so, so <laughs> bench more than me, and then you can tell me how to coach the bench. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck your bench. But, <laughs> yeah, come, come for my 315 for 16. Let me see you hit that for 20. Mom. Hey, dude, I think you forgot. I was getting... Oh, well, to admittedly, my Larson's not that far off my comp bench. I have to be honest about that. But I, I did 315 for 10 Larson uh, post that 1800 total. Yeah. I, I don't know. But that was that was like I was fat boy strong. And like, <laughs> time. But on the on the bend the bar cue, I just it's not it's not that that's the end all be all. It's yeah. just that that's another tool. It's just yeah, another no, tool I, in the I, toolbox. I, right. I you don't always need, you know, a. a 10 millimeter socket wrench, but you got it in the toolbox so you can pull it out when you need it. Yeah. Right. Um, last thing to, to, before we move on to the next topic, um, I just want to touch on, and I'm curious if you use anything like this. I've never actually um, asked you about this or really anything, but I've always used some, or no, I haven't always, I've recently in the last year, year and a half developed um, kind of like an intent sheet that I always create before I go to my training sessions, minus on the days I just am rushed and don't have time, but I'll sit down and create an intent. Now this doesn't always mean cues. Sometimes it does. Sometimes I'll add a cue on there, but it could even just be an intent of some kind of mental focus. So for instance, like uh, the one I showed in my YouTube video where I was talking about this was I intended to just go really heavy on lap pull downs. It's as sim- simple as that may sound. Sometimes we forget to think about what our workout is ahead and you might get to the lap pull down and it might be a little bit more function based. You're, you're really focusing on elevation and scapular depression and moving really well and maybe not going as heavy as where that day I was like, now I really want some overload in the mid range. Not going to care too much if I'm perfectly elevating at the top and I want to just lift some heavy fucking weight as we're on the low row. I was like, Oh, I really want to feel a mind muscle connection between my low lats and not worry about load at all. And I kind of go down the list of exercises. Do you do anything like that? Whether it be mentally or actually physically writing down? 
Yeah. Um, during my most successful training, uh, I, I absolutely do. Uh, I, I don't write anything down, but uh, I visualize the the loading that I'm going to uh, to achieve in that in that session, and I'm pretty spot on with being able to call my numbers. Uh, this isn't like uh, it's not ego driven. It's not saying like, oh, I'm going to lift such and such, and then it's like way out of pocket for me to be able to do that that day. <laughs> I, I mean, me, I mean, saying like, okay, like logically, like I can do this, but it's going to be challenging. And then going in, into the gym and and, and doing that, um, I, I I I think that some of my best training has also been done uh, after just driving to the gym. I train at home a lot, but frequently I'll drive to another gym to train, like going to Unleash Strength over Manassas, the Shop Gym in Manassas or Ashburn, and just driving cranking some music up and visualize you know drinking a little caffeine visualizing what i'm about to do in that session um it, i always find that i i it gives me that time to kind of just like stop thinking about anything else and it's that transitional period from what i was doing working handling client stuff and updates and feedback and all that stuff and then that maybe you know 20 25 minute drive or so i have to the gym transitioning me into okay now i'm stepping in to lift and this is my time and uh, my best training cycle of all time he and i were talking about this before uh, we started recording here i was calling for um, almost three straight months i was calling the weights that i was going to hit on my heavy spd day i was doing my heaviest squat bench and deadlift on the same day and i for almost three straight months I called the exact numbers I was going to hit and successfully did them topping out uh, with my last heavy session uh, being a triple at 585 on squat, a triple at 445 on bench and a triple at 675 on sumo deadlift on a stiff bar. And then I, and then I, I tapered, uh, peaked, and tested. In the next let's, week. let's talk about that real quick. I think there's a lot there. So, so one, um, I, I used to always do mentally exactly what you're saying. I would think about the lift picture and visualize myself doing it. Think about my loading. But what I found is I, that the reason I started doing the list is I found every exercise, I'd think a little too much about load and like just visually seeing myself do it and not enough about maybe like a certain desired outcome that was a little bit more, I guess, thoughtful towards like, like for instance, the reason I want to go heavy on those lap pull downs, I realized I just for weeks had not been, and was going really focused on function, you know, something like that, but really getting into the idea of like visualization slash planning ahead, regardless if it's that or not, if it's load focus, one thing I hugely believe in is if you can do this responsibly and uh, as was it uncle Ben who said this, right. With great power comes great responsibility. You have to be really responsible with this because otherwise you'll be an ego driven asshole who overshoots. But if you can really start to call your numbers ahead of time, what I found it does for me mentally is it lines up my week. So I'm on top of my shit. Like, and yeah, you can be like, I'm always on top of my shit. But when you know, yo, I'm yeah. about to go hit 585 yeah. for a triple yeah. this weekend, Deep. I'm not getting bad sleep before hundred percent. Dude, Babe, that let's that have training cycle night right before the the night before. Nope, sorry. Like I wish we could, but I got squats to go tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? Like nothing's gonna stop me. That you know, training like, cycle I had, I was doing exactly that. By by the time I hit my heavy SBD day, I was calling the numbers I was gonna hit for that subsequent Friday, which mm-hmm. is when I was doing my heavy SBD days. And the entirety of that next week, everything was in preparation for that. Yeah. Uh, I was training three days per week, so I was training Sundays. Tuesdays and Fridays. I had Wednesdays and Thursdays off a 48 hour off period of lifting prior to coming in and just going absolutely ham on Fridays. And the entirety of that week, those sessions that were leading into Friday, when I was training, I saw them merely as preparatory for what I was about to do on Friday. So there was nothing that I was doing in those sessions that was going to degrade my performance on that Friday. It was merely just keep my foot on the gas a little bit, driving me towards that heavy session I was doing at the end of the week. Mm-hmm. And then that two day off period, sometimes I'd have like 24 hours off and I'm just like, I'm just like chomping at the bit. I was like, man, I just want to get in the gym and lift, you know, but it's Thursday. I got to take today off too, you know, and it would get to the point where I just felt like I can't wait. Like I'd wait. And then I remember I'd wake up on Friday morning, snatch ton of food usually have like some of my buddies come over and we train together and um and then just absolutely demolish it but it was that anticipation of it it was the 
the preparation mentally and then by calling those numbers and mentally preparing for that, making sure everything else sleep was dialed in. Recovery Dude, let's was dialed just, in. Stress management was dialed in. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And and we're just going to go there. I'm just going to be honest. So something I've never really said out loud, I've kind of maybe mentioned this to people around me, Ooh, but this? I, um, I wait, are you still there? Okay. There we go yeah. for, for a sec. So I constantly visualize myself in multiple ways that have to do with whatever goal I have or something even more grander uh, while I do cardio, every time I do cardio and every time I really have a time to think about, even sometimes just in the car, listening to music. And I, I used to think this was really corny. And so I was like, be nervous to talk about this. But what I mean by that is like, let's say I have 500 calories of cardio, get a real long, like 30, 40 minute, you know, cardio session. And I'm just blasting some music and really amping up all like during the cardio session while the music's about a peak to a drop and all the shit's going crazy. I start to visualize myself at the meet or maybe even some real unrealistic scenario I'll never be in where I'm set in some world record that I know I can't really get, but I'm almost like, no, I think I could get this. You know what I mean? And I find though, that keeps me so driven to do the cardio, to get through the prep. It's like long-term looking ahead and that anticipation, exactly what you're talking about. So it's like not even on the short term, just like knowing, okay, next week I really want to hit this number, but also knowing like, oh, I have this meat coming up. Now, admittedly, this has bit me in the ass in the past where you start to call your numbers too much and you start to think you're Superman and you're infallible and like nothing can go wrong. And even like, sometimes I'm thinking as soon as I'm done with this meet, I want to do another meet and then I want to do another meet. And like, I never take an actual off season or a downtime. But when I do this responsibly, I find it just makes my overall, we'll call it like lifestyle, very conducive to results. And I think that's really like, there's a lot of power in that. I don't think people realize yeah. That visualization is just practically, pragmatically inciting a lot of like small daily actionable outcome changes that you're just on top of your shit a little bit. You really, you're really talking about self talk. Yeah, you know, yeah. and 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 when when the when you're saying I'm going to do this, I'm going mm-hmm. to do this, I'm capable of doing this, I'm going to fucking not not only am I going to do it, I'm going to fucking annihilate this when I do it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make it look easy, you know, and. um I think there's a lot of value in that, you know, for some people, it could put them in kind of a negative head space. You know, they think it's them versus the world. And you got to beat everyone else and this and that. But if you can harness that and kind of uh, flip that switch, as I like to say, when, when you need it most, it can be a very, very powerful, powerful and beneficial tool. And it's not just getting hyped because you and I see plenty of people who they don't do hundred percent of what they could do outside of the gym and they go in the gym and, and they don't, necessarily visualize themselves mm-hmm. as being the strongest or they don't they don't see you know their future of uh, you know what they could become and, and working towards that they just make loud noises <laughs> right they make loud noises and they make they make it look like they're getting hyped you know yeah, what throw, i'm saying throw some weights around a little bit and, and that's and that's very that's very different because um i'm always more wary of the lifters that internalize that a little bit more you know because you, you know that they may look, may look a little bit calm on the exterior, but they're going fucking wild inside. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that's what I'm like when I'm when I'm really when I'm pushing those really really big lifts. That's where I'm going mentally. I'm not I'm not screaming, um, and there's nothing wrong with screaming and yelling, bleeding out of the nose as you would like to do. You know, but, I'm a, I'm a bit of both though. Like it, it, I, I know you are. Explain it, but on the inside. It's even more intense. I know, it's just and kind I, of bubbling, and out. I feel that too. And I know that yeah. you have you have a look in your eyes too. Like I know, I know the exact look that you yeah. get when you're about to <laughs> you're about to send it. <laughs> yes, yes, you do too, man. I remember I know. when we we did that. Uh, God, what was it? A four eighty five for ten? Yeah, yeah that's what it was. Kilos for 10. Yeah, two twenty four eighty five for ten. That yeah, was a cool. nutty set. That was really nutty, actually. And yeah. I remember your your mindset after. Even even Umar, I forget, Umar said something in just such an Umar fashion way. He was like, yeah, I was like scared, man. Like, <laughs> Yeah, and, I, and I, I think I was like, what do you mean you were scared? Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. You can't be scared. I'm the one under the weight, and I'm not scared. <laughs> you know? Yeah, what, what's nuts about that session was that I did that, and I did a 5% load drop, hit it for 10, and another 5% yeah, load that drop. Yeah, that would actually, bro. So I it wasn't mean, just the top set. I did three sets, like, within 10% of each other for a 3 by 10 As cool as that top set was, that, that last back down set was substantially, like, that, that takes some... 
I don't even think that was optimal, bro. I think that no, was it was just not optimal. optimal. That was it was not just optimal. Like, it was just literally just like grit at that point. But at, at that, at the like, same time, that's yeah. the only way you can ever train that. Like that, there, yeah. there's, there's something to be said about doing some shit that's not optimal. Yeah. I don't know how you would ever orchestrate a plan to incorporate that, like because you can't. Like it's something you it's just do by off. nature. It's called small, <laughs> bro. Yeah, 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 yeah. Small uh, nuts, dude. Yeah. Um, All right, let's move on. Let's move on. This yeah, one. yeah. Um, okay, informative rants or alternative topics as we have it listed on the notion sheet. Um, so understanding skill practice of powerlifting, I want to touch on this. Um, you know, really, what what do we mean here when we talk about including heavy singles in the off season or quote unquote um, comp specific skill practice? with the main lifts, you know, what are we trying to achieve? And really, I guess, when are you using this? And this has really been in fashion, I would say, and still kind of is, um, I would, I would really say the last, what, five, six years of powerlifting coaching, you see a lot of coaches who I think the good coaches use this as a tool and the bad coaches use this as a paradigm they live by, you know what yeah. I mean? It's like yeah. live eat and, and sleep and die by yeah. the singles like, like what do you mean you're not doing it. you're not doing singles right now like you're a power lifter that's the most specific thing you could do well if I, that was, if that's my... all we did we just max out sbd once per week and that's power lifting like that's not what necessarily makes you the best power lifter yeah we tried that in the early 2000s it didn't work <laughs> yeah yeah so so go ahead and explain a little bit i'll let you talk on this one just incorporating singles in the off season how often do you do it What's the purpose? How do you view it as a tool? When are you using it, et cetera? I'm more inclined to use some of that on um, on bench work, honestly, than I am squats and deads. It, okay. If I were to just have a general rule, right? Um, but I think that sub max singles on squats and deads are definitely useful. Um, it depends on the phase of training someone's in and what they actually need at that point and, and also what they like. Um, but, you know, working up to a single at a six, a single at a seven or something like that, um, backing down off that, I could even see like a light single uh, followed by a top set, followed by back down work. I've used stuff like that before. But to be honest, I don't use a ton of singles for off-season work for the majority of my people. Um, I don't think that it's absolutely necessary. And, you know, with the inclusion of, you know, higher intensity singles comes the additional fatigue that comes along with that. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that needs to be balanced with regards to the amount of training volume someone has and the the intensity of that volume-based work that they're doing there too. But, I'm okay with someone's like ability to handle uh, top end singles degrading a little bit. If it means that we're in a phase of training where we're trying to induce more hypertrophy um, and bring their work capacity up because we're going to get to that later on. Right. I don't, I don't need them to be peaked when they're 18 weeks out from a meet. I don't need them to feel like they're like optimally in their groove with 90% to 95% on their squat. Um, like it, that far out from a comp. I would argue if you are feeling that you're not actually getting stronger long term. And I've seen this in person. Um, I, I, I mean, because we train at powerlifting gyms, so we see people are coached by powerlifting coaches. And I, the most common mistake, one of my buddies, you know, I won't name names, but it's just constant. I was like, dude, you've done singles. Literally, it was like seven months straight of singles. And, and he would do volume after that was always his like rebuttal was oh, I do volume after the singles. And I'm like, yeah, after you're mentally burnt after taking a single at eight, you know what I mean? And he was doing this for like seven months straight, making no progress. Swear to God, they started incorporating some triples and fives in there for top sets instead of singles all the time. Dude, this dude went from squatting like low sixes to high sixes. It was crazy. Yeah. It was just, he blew up after such a long plateau. And that was the number one thing they changed. It's just getting some volume. Um, I, I really, it's all it is a skill practice. It's not adaptation. It's not getting stronger. It's skill practice. You need to know how to do it. It's a small piece of the totality of getting stronger, but you're actually not inciting a lot of adaptation behind it. I think my biggest gripe with singles is it causes a lot of like 
like they're mentally taxing. Like you're like, oh fuck, I got to lift this. But physiologically, you're actually not getting that much stress. We know this from literature. Like a hard set of five at RP8 is going to be much more taxing on your physiology, meaning your CNS and your, yeah, yeah. And a lot of the, yeah. the old trope is that the single is more taxing on your CNS. It's not true. Your CNS goes hand in hand with your muscular system. They don't operate independently. And so those fives are taxing. Yeah. So, it- a, a, a singles can be used even on like a, like a, like a D-load type week. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I remember um, a little while back I had uh, decided to kind of uh, to test my deadlift. I was on comp plates on a stiff bar at the time. Uh, and I, and it was, I, I pulled 300 kilos. This is before I pulled, pulled 700. Um, and th- all I did to taper that week was literally working up to a top single in my squat, on my bench Monday, uh, top single squat and bench on Wednesday. These were not max singles. This mm-hmm. was like in the seven range. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then I tested on Friday and felt felt rock solid. Right. So you can you can definitely use that as a tool there. But I would also say on on what I mentioned about how it incorporated on a bench press, the bench can obviously usually handle not only higher volumes than the squat and deadlift, but usually higher average intensities there mm-hmm. also incorporating single work on a bench press and or top set back down work on a bench press is usually something that's that's definitely very productive um using multiple top sets per week with back offs on a squat you do that three days out of the week it's going to roast you right yeah. but you, you do that on bench and some other variations and it actually may be very beneficial yeah i think the only time and this, this would have to be such a specific case. And I still probably wouldn't opt for this, but like you make a good point that on, on bench, I think it's just easy to handle too, because you just are using less adrenaline. I, I mean, maybe there's the rare types out there who hype up for bench as much or more than their squat and dead, but there's just something intrinsically scarier to me about a squat. And I think for most people, that's the case. And I think you just naturally see this without even having to think about it. When, when you do a heavy single on squat, it's like, Oh, God, I got to prepare for this on bench. It's a little bit easier. It's not that you don't have to prepare, but there's just a little less fear. There's a little less, um, you know, adrenaline. There's, there's something about it. There's that less lets final you, loading, which is a huge that contributor too. to that overall fatigue. Well, and that's just overall fatigue. load. Right. And yeah. so that's the other thing too, is one is just your upper body muscles. The other one is a full body, like compressive well, spinal I, cord. Even know? then, if I single four or five on my squat and four or five on my bench press, I, if four, my best bench is 500. My best squat is 615. So four or five on a, on a squat is obviously not as high of a percentage of my 1RM. I still feel like that is more taxing than singling four or five on a bench for me. Yeah, I agree. I you know, agree. Just because it, it, if someone's really efficient in their bench press, like you can you can throw a lot a, a lot of kind of higher end work at them, especially yeah. if they're a higher max grip bencher. Well, and what I was going to say is the one time I could see maybe pushing this more is someone who's just so calm and so like almost doesn't want to lift heavy in a way that they can take those singles completely still face, completely, you know, poised. And then they really are just pushing their back downs after. But then again, I would just make the point, why even have the single in there in the first place? You know, and so that's the weird thing is to me, when we say skill practice, what, what adaptation are we really trying to get? Well, we're actually trying to adapt the ability to hype up and get some adrenaline going. We're trying to adapt the execution under extreme strain, that one RM. See, the thing that's different about one RM than, say, a five RM is the one thing I'll say a one RM is harder on is, like, you can't misgroove on it at all. Five RM, you can misgroove on the second, third rep, and then correct yourself mid-set, which happens a lot. You get one chance on the, the one RM. And so that's what we were saying when we say skill practice, it's this ability to just bring it all together in this one rep, but that's all it is, is really skill practice. And I agree that like in the off season, we should really be focusing, I think a lot more on pushing rep PRs and actually inciting a lot of bigger adaptation. And I think I, I really took this away after starting working with you was I always kind of did that, but with you, I really saw the value of pushing those fives and tens and like not being afraid to dramatically. Cause for me going away from singles was kind of like triples and maybe sevens and eights, you know, yeah. with you, you, it's like you'll go fives and tens, right? Like one squat day is fives. The other I'll go ten, 10 to twelve on a squat day. Yeah, I'll go 12 and, to 15, you know, and man, there's there's some awesomeness in that. Now, yeah. I will say this: there is a time and a place, though, 
for the singles. Right now, you're doing singles. Right now, I'm doing singles. When is that time and a place? And funny enough, I actually think it's kind of the opposite of what most coaches would argue. I don't like keeping the comp specific skill practice trained in the off season that often, maybe here and there, dependent on the situation. But I find when my athletes are a little de elevated in maximal strength so much because of a detraining period, it can bring it back up pretty quick. Bring it back up real yeah. quick all of a sudden because you don't lose strength like that. And you can still get in some volume, and those loads are going to be low enough that even if right now 405 feels a little extra heavy on the squat. It's like that's not taxing you the way when you're really trained and you're hitting 555 now. That's a big difference. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, one other reason why I would see to uh, incorporate singles would also be how many times have you, ha have you handled X amount of weight, right? So, like, yeah. you and I can both remember, like, the first time we ever squatted 405 or the first time we squatted 405 for some reps or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And at that point, it's like, okay, there was a day where you'd only had it on your back once. There was another day where you'd had it on your back twice. At some point, you'd had it on your back maybe five times, right, ten times. But if you get to the point where, okay, I can, I can work up to this, and it feels like a six to seven RPE, it's super snappy and smooth, I don't need to get hyped to do it, and then back down from that, I do think sometimes, especially for those lifters who tend to get kind of um, a little scared of certain loads mm – -hmm you can start to acclimate them to being like, Hey, it's an everyday thing for you to be able to be capable of walking up to this weight and just smashing it and then stepping away from it and going into some other work right there. And regardless of whether or not that is achieving substantial physiological adaptations, I think that's beneficial mentally. Oh, totally. And I think that's actually how Bulgarian thrives or what we call on our, our websites, a kind of a version of what, people have come to know as Bulgarian, which is really bastardized in itself. But uh, we have the squat King program for our group coaching athletes. If they want to just really master the squat really quickly in eight weeks, the squat King program is, is literally just building up to a, a single on some variation of a squat, basically any day you train. And I don't think this is inciting really any physiological adaptation, at least not very much because you will plateau if you try to run it longer than eight weeks, probably. Um, but I think what's happening is you end up feeling so confident and knowing exactly how to orchestrate your form. You know exactly how to get tight. And th these are the things people always tell me is that like when they run it, they're like, dude, I just feel so confident in my squat right now. There's this like ability to just know, and you get so casual about it, dude, I swear to God, when I'm really in groove on that thing, I go one red, two reds, three reds, four reds, five reds. Oh like yeah. I I've done four to, yeah. 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 You and I, you and I have done some similar stuff with regards to, you know, doing some of those daily maxing things. And uh, mm -hmm. you definitely get really dialed in at your ability to hit those singles. But also I think you also have to view it as like, you've got uh, pretty low fatigue from having very lacking volume training volume there. So especially if you're coming out of a phase of training that had like at least a moderate amount of training volume going into mm -hmm. a very high intensity, very Bingo. low volume phase you know, you're still riding that wave, that volume coming out of that previous phase, and that's helping to potentiate your strength moving. Into and it potentiates the volume cycle coming after that comes after that, that which is fucking which part. is why it's necessary to actually cycle through higher volume phases and lower volume phases. And that is the main point I wanted to actually make when we were talking about this. What I had written down is that at the end of the day. I really think programming needs to be more fluid. And we'll talk about this a little bit later in the Q&A section. But I think people need to think less about, oh, I kind of keep a comp specific approach to my programming or I keep a, you know, off season approach or whatever the fuck, you know, terminology they're throwing on it. Really, like it's like you said, you have tools, and you utilize it at the right time. And every coach claims they do this, but I don't think they actually do because they, they end up having too much of a style where every athletes kind of getting some similar type of program as we're all vastly rework with my guys, like completely different approaches. And so I think that's what you have to do is blend it. It's like, okay, right now, have I been doing a lot of volume and is my skill practice low? Well, let's do a lot of singles. If not, if maybe it's the opposite, I just came off a Bulgarian stint or whatever the fuck, like that's a perfect time to get back to volume. Now, I think the key though is easing into it, regardless of whatever you're doing, where I see people go wrong with both of these is whether you're going into a volume phase or singles phase, they try to load it up too quick. They like, and this was my mistake when I started with you, it, it was, it was blasphemy. Like it, I couldn't understand how I couldn't do 
like something like 365 to 385 for tens on squat. Yeah. But, but that was because like, to me, I can do that for one set, but when I have two really gnarly volume squat days, one's five, the other's tens, and I'm doing three straight sets, even though I theoretically on paper, I should be able to do that. I just was not trained for that. And so yeah. I, that, I, I don't know if you remember this, but the very first week I completely butchered and I yeah. was like, had to really drop. Like, I, can't do, I can't do this. And I was like, you're lifting too heavy. Yeah. And now that, that seems stupid to me. Cause I'm like, dude, 365 is light. I could do that for like 20 if I needed to. Right. And I think I was like, then why aren't you doing it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so dude. And then, and then I was like, all right, I checked the ego the next week. I think I came in and did like 320 for like yeah. straight sets of 10 or something. And it was and much more in the pocket, way more in the pocket. And then boom, the like squat just blew up. And then it, that was when I realized there's more than RP. There's more than singles. There's more than high reps or this or that. It's not as straightforward as just doing tens at six. It's like, it, what was funny is I actually wasn't doing three sets of 10 at, I think it was like RP five or six. I had written down. I was doing where the first set was a six. And then after that, the only way I could keep going at that RP is if I dramatically reduced the load, but I was stubborn because to me, it was like, how could that possibly affect me that hard? But that's where if you're detrained from your work capacity standpoint, you're just not going to be able to do three sets of 10 at that heavy a load until you've trained it. And then all of a sudden you get to the point where you're doing what you did, which was at 45 for 10 and then little yeah. 5% drops for more yeah. sets of 10, which is nuts. Yeah. And, and, and I don't see that any of that as a negative because that just means that you can gain that adaptation with less work in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it goes without saying that anytime you enter the first week of training cycle, you should be introing yourself to that that training split and, and the overall amount of work should not be um, an insurmountable task. That first week should be entirely doable. And then you're going to notch up from there, right? Yep. Or where a lot of people shoot themselves in the foot, just as you said, they try to either load it up too much, they try to kick up the volume too high in the first week and they end up running themselves right into the ground. And then it's stop, stop. It's okay to look at past performances, but where is Brendan today where's dylan today like we can't just be like oh just because in the past you hit this number you should expect this number it's like no no no. where where are you currently at oh yeah. you, you took two weeks off of your squats because you had an injury well like guess what you had gonna a have to surgery and didn't past. sleep for like a week and a half exactly so a lot of people yeah. might see your your training out of context and be like, you know, what, what is this like 455 here that you're hitting? Like that, that should be like, you used to do that for tens, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and they can't understand that it's like where you're currently at. You're, you're an ever evolving system. The human body is constantly in a state of change and adaptation. And so you have to program around that. And I, I think this is the most like esoteric thing to coaches for some reason. Uh, and even admittedly to me in the beginning, but now I, I'm, I don't even, I, I do look at past training history. It's very important because when you are in a certain trained state, if you're in a similar state than where you were maybe two years ago when you had some of your best performances, you can definitely infer back to that and be like, okay, at that time I was doing this, that worked really well. I'm in kind of a similar spot. It makes sense to probably try that right now. Mm -hmm. But the worst thing you can do is the opposite where you're nowhere near that. And you're looking at old performances and, and I get guys who do that all the time. They're kind of in like a little rut because they, they tore an adductor. This, this is a common one. Um, th this just happened actually recently, like maybe a few months ago. And he was like, yo, when I, my squat was really blown, this is what I was hitting. And I was like, yes, but you didn't have an adductor tear. You were just coming off of it at that time. Yeah. And I get your strength is coming back quick, but we can't rush into that. Otherwise you're going to tear some shit again. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that you don't own that strength. People think they hit a PR, they own that strength, but that strength is theirs. That strength is fucking borrowed. Yep. You got that for that moment, for that day. And even if you hold on to it for a little bit, at some point in your life, it's going to decline. It's going to fade away. You're not going to be able to get it again, right? But uh, in the meantime, it's going to ebb and flow. And you yep. just have to be okay with that. You have to be fluid with that. You have to react to uh, to what you're actually experiencing in the gym rather than trying to fit a square peg through a round hole and saying well this is what led me to my best performance so i'm just going to keep doing this and banging my head against the wall until it works yep and that's yeah. that's why training data is it can be very uh we'll say uh i guess misleading is a good good term because it's it's again it's not as simple as just what's worked previously it's also where you currently at yeah um, but i do think it's it's beneficial to look back you know, you and I have discussed some things I've done in the past, and, and uh, I think it's useful not just to look at the overall training program and say, this is exactly what I need to do, 
But like how I sent you that training cycle and I said, look how I was being fluid with certain accessories and the, the mm-hmm. way that I was doing that. I wasn't as set in stone about that. Um, you can start to pick up on, on maybe that one or two little nuggets mm-hmm. of information because we forget too, because, because like you and I have been through so many different training programs, so many different mm-hmm. styles and experience so much that if you look back at something you did two or three years ago, you can say, Oh man, I remember loving that exercise. Why did I ever stop doing that? Mm-hmm. Right. Or, and that's, Oh, that's actually what I'm talking about. Those is, is being fluid with that. So yeah, mm-hmm. no, agree. That's not training history. That's necessarily bad. It's just, you have to know what bits and pieces are worth looking at and applying yes. currently. Yes. I totally agree with that. And that actually, you mentioned the intuition. I think that's a huge part of coaching. Actually. I always would, always, always argue that the best coaches are both analytical and intuitive. You can't just be one or the other. If you're the intuitive guy, you're just like, oh, I think today you just need some singles, bro. And you're just like, <laughs> shit in there. And if you're the analytical guy, you're like, well, on March 31st of this year, you were doing this and today's March 31st. So I think we should do the same workout. <laughs> it's like you need to actually have some like fluid flow to it. And yeah, no, I'm hundred percent on board with that. Yeah. And the best lifters are also the same. Yes, they are actually totally. I think, yeah. in fact, I think you really see that actually in the lifters, but and, that's a whole conversation. And I, and I think what you said earlier about how you'll individualize approaches, oh, I will do the same provided that the lifter is meeting me with the feedback that I ask for. Yep. Right. Yep, yep, because yep. you need, you need a lifter who's coming to you with ideas mm-hmm. and saying, Hey, what do you think about this? Or I had this thought, or this is something that's worked well for me. What do you think about this? Or, I'm encountering this issue and here's how I'm trying to solve it. But, you know, they, they have to be engaged. If you have someone who just receives training from you and then sends you some videos and then receives more training from you, but never actually takes that step back to analyze this, what this they're is, doing, again, they're not going to progress the same. Yeah, no. And this is such a like modern coaching flaw where if you look at mentorship across like literally the history of mankind, whether it was like, um, like the reason they call it, like, uh, if you've ever heard of like Socratic practice where you like mm-hmm. constantly question people on things to get them, uh, sometimes they'll do this in college settings where they have the kids sit in circles and they just have them question one another. The idea is that the person questioning the other person will hopefully get that question to incite some internal thought processes going on. And it creates some, you know, ongoing, it's the same thing with like actual gurus, not the negative gurus in India. And then even like the top tier MMA coach is there's a lot of UFC and MMA coaches who do things where they kind of lightly guide and say, Hey, try this, try that. And then the, the, the fighter comes back and they, they tell them like how it was feeling. And it's like crafted together for some reason though, especially like in recent times, it's become the new like thing where the coach has to have all the answers, tells you exactly what to do. You just listen and, and coach always knows what's best. But you know as well as I do that we can't do our jobs optimally if we're not getting some feedback and also changing yeah. our mind on some things sometimes. Lin- side note, Lindsay gets so mad if I use the Socratic method on her. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, actually, do all day. Socrates was put to death because he questioned people too much. I'm not kidding. The story of Socrates, he literally pissed people off. by que- they, they called him a, a heretic. They said he didn't have religion and that he was questioning the gods, where he was actually really pro-religion. But the thing is, is he questioned people because he felt they weren't religious. And so what he would yeah. do is ask them questions. Kind of He's them. trying to get them to think deeper. Yes. And then and they're, they're like, like that motherfucker don't that. make me think. <laughs> <laughs> How yeah. dare you make me think about my beliefs? Yeah, 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 dude. That's analyze funny. my own thoughts. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay hates the Socratic method. I can say oh, that because I know for a fact she's never watched one of these podcasts. She's definitely not watching one. She's understand. way too busy, man. Yeah. Uh, okay, moving on to the Q and A. So this one's good. I know you didn't really prepare this ahead of time. I I prepared ahead, so I'm kind That's of okay. cheating. But one of the questions we had last time, and we'll probably just stick to these two because we're already like real deep into this episode, but what are some ideas you guys believe that aren't, not isn't, I had a grammar (laughs) error, uh, grammatical error, but what are some ideas that you guys believe aren't supported by science or go against scientific data? Um, So I kind of wrote a few things here. Do you want to start this one or do you want me to go? You can take this one because I was telling you before that I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to listen to what you say and maybe, um, Yeah, we can can bounce off my ideas too. So one thing that's not really supported by data, at least in the way that I think people would argue, 
is um, micronutrition plays a huge role in satiety beyond just fiber and digestion, right? So I truly believe that the human body knows when it's getting fed beyond just a state of energy. So like what I mean by that is like you lit, we all know optimal human performance doesn't just come from ingesting protein powders, uh, carbolin and some kind of fat source. And that's all you eat for, for your diet. You're not going to be healthy. Olive oil, protein powder, olive oil. carbolin. Yep, just mix exactly. it together. Just mix it in a shake and you're good. That's why I hate those like like concoction drinks people make where it's like, oh, huge like meal replacement. You can replace all your meals and stuff. But anyway, I think you're hum the human body. I don't even think. I, I know this from my own experience that whenever I eat really micronutrient-dense foods and even when fiber intake is equated and when overall like volume of, of food we'll say is equated, I am just way less hungry with more micronutrients. Actually to the point that like – even recently, I, I had to check myself. I was like, yo, I've been on my micros, but I haven't been on them as much as I want to be. And since getting back on that gain train again, on that train of, of slamming micros daily, my hunger levels have just dropped and it's been making this diet so much easier. And and I, I think this is something so many people miss. The human body is so smart. Food is signaling. People don't understand this. That every single thing you ingest has some form of a signal that gets carried out after. So whether it be vitamins and minerals signaling certain processes in the body, whether it be hormonal responses or just from a straight energy standpoint, having blood glucose available, total energy available, storage of energy later. There's a million things your body's doing with foods. It is not just an energy system. There's a ton of actual pathways being lit up that are, are being orchestrated by the signaling from the food you ingest. Um, and there's also things with, with the gut, which we can get into later too, with like when you eat certain foods and your digestion and how the gut and brain work together in kind of this feedback loop, um, really, I think is going to hugely affect your, your satiety level. So that's one thing I think, what are your thoughts on that? I don't have a great answer for something that I can think of off the top of my head that, that I, that I know for a fact is not supported by science that I really firmly believe in. That's not to see, you know, me and you know that I, I, I'm not just saying, Oh, the only things that I do are, you know, research based. Uh, I, I, it took me 30 blood. minutes to think of these. It took me a while. Yeah. Cause we don't really think like that. That that's yeah. the, actually exactly what you're saying is I don't think, okay, is this supported by science? I just kind of know, you know what yeah. I mean? Through yeah. experience. And then I'm like, Oh, science also backs this up. You know yeah, I mean? exactly. Like anything that I'm like, Oh, maybe that, but I'm like, well, I also know science does back that up. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so we'll, we'll keep going with mine, and then sure. you can just give me your input on this too. Sure. Do you notice a difference though when you have higher levels of micronutrition? I want an honest answer. Do you feel like you ever notice a difference of like having more satiety versus like not? Dude, I've got a crazy. Uh, my hunger is. I'm always eating, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it's> like, <laughs> like it's I, like, like, I feel it's, like that would make you more aware of it, though. I know for me, it's like yeah. I'm dieting even on like 4,500 calories, and I'm just like so hungry, you know. Yeah, I, the biggest thing that impacts my satiety is fat intake. Like if my fat, like yeah, the, the other week I had, um, we had gotten like some some smoked salmon. And I made like two like lox cream cheese bagels, which is like not a staple in my diet by any means. But I was like, oh man, this looks really good right now. And I like straight up like had a hard time finishing the second one because I'm just, I like, wasn't used to having like that much fat. Bro, uh, and it was like go four hours breakfast. later, I was still full. Dude, anytime I go to a breakfast and get one of those fat fucking just bacon and sausage and eggs and oil and fucking, you know, hash browns deep fried and everything and i eat that dude but like after even if the calories aren't that high bro i'm in like a coma for like five six hours anything else i can keep slamming food you give me sushi i swear i'll eat like three thousand four thousand calories worth of sushi 30 minutes later i'm good to eat <laughs> that didn't take super high that's exactly how i it sounds I feel. like we're going to a diner when you come visit in june Oh, bro. Oh, I'm so down, dude. I, I love breakfast food. That's like yeah. my fucking staple. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way with, with fat, actually. I do. But, but no, I haven't noticed a, a huge difference. Although, um, you know, I, I, I guess I haven't tracked that super closely to say, like, go through a period where I'm not hitting my micro as well and then go through a period where I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Um, I will say really briefly, the reason when I noticed that is when I went through this phase where I just overhauled my entire diet to like literally only be micronutrient dense foods. And at first I thought it was the fiber intake, but I realized even when I checked that, 
that I was just fucking so full off of so much less. That one, though, I will say the total volume was probably a lot more dense, but I have a hard time believing that the, the expansion of my stomach is playing that large of a role in satiety. That does play a role in satiety. We know that by science, but I don't think it's that simple. I really do think it was the micronutrition. That was when I noticed it was in a very extreme overhaul of my diet. It actually wasn't sustainable, which is why I went away from that. Um, okay. Uh, second thing here. Uh, so I didn't know how to write this one down or put it, but I put daily stretching slash body flow. Cause it's really not stretching specifically in the morning helps prevent injury and, and kind of sets your body up. So this is things they've done in India for years with yoga or what they call, I think it's a up a yoga or something along that, those lines. And there's a lot of people who do this. Um, a lot of, uh, Zen monks and like other people used to do this to some degree too. But like, basically I have found after going down, like just a rabbit hole of trying to improve my mobility and setting my body up to feel good and whatnot. Um, one, I actually came across some literature where basically what they found is after you, you sleep your synovial fluid and just your, your, bo your body's lubrication of its joints kind of pools and everything is like, that's why when you wake up in the morning, everything's like cold and achy and kind of like, Oh, you got to stretch out when you kind of move. But I find specifically if after first thing, when I wake up or sometime right after I wake up, maybe I grab breakfast first or not, doesn't really matter. If I really get moving into some really deep stretching, I have been able to go into the gym and just warm up on the empty barbell and not just warm up there, but I feel like amazing. And even now as I'm pushing really heavy loads where I normally would be feeling really tight, beat up and kind of achy, it's like I squat 573 the other week and then pull 661 for some reps and I'm killing training out right now and I'm waking up. And as long as I do that stretching, when I get in the gym, literally hours after I'm done, I'm just moving and feeling better. And I find the same thing with walking as yeah, well. Yeah, walking, like, walking get, can be Getting up, get outside and, and yeah. walk. Yeah. Uh, because it always leaves me feeling so much more just ready, to, ready to move. It primes me to do anything else. Like get yeah. up and, and just physically move. Like we'll, we'll just get Some up, kind of move breakfast move. and walk the dogs or something I like that. I think the one little catch I would throw in there is like the reason I like the, the body flow is just because it's really not stretching. It's like movement, but it's, it's because I, um, you get into some deep end range positions you don't normally get mm. into. And I don't even think it's helping mobility long-term. I think that's mostly going to come from loaded movement and things like that. Maybe, maybe it does. I don't know. It's hard to say, but what I think it's helping is like, I'm getting fluids and, and the joints moving in positions I just normally wouldn't be in. And I'm doing it daily. And I yeah. think I have a hard time believing that babies can do perfect body weight, ass to grass squats, have perfect mobility across all backgrounds across like it doesn't matter where the kid comes from they all have like just beautiful mobility and then we lose it into age the, the reason we lose it's got to be because we just stop moving you know we don't have long-term data on it but it's got to yeah. be and to me that's all this is it's like i'm getting on the ground basically in the morning like a kid and crawling around a little bit you know what i mean it's like i'm getting into positions i normally don't do and i just find it's almost like restorative in a way and i i a lot of people would be like oh you could just achieve the same thing if you went for a walk and then like you know fucking hopped on the barbell and did some extra reps no but, no I, I, I don't know. i'm i'm with it i mean you're get you're you're moving joints through a fuller range of motion at a time when you normally wouldn't yeah you're, you're greasing the groove yeah. Right. Well, I'm also like, for instance, when I, let's say I'm doing like that, like forward lunge stretch or like a pigeon pose, I'm doing it like active, like I'm moving through the range of motion and like actually like pump it. Like I, I finish and I'm out of breath. Like it's not just like some static stretch. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think that's really worth pointing out. It's not just stretching. But yeah. yeah that's and I, I think you can achieve a similar thing with like a daily movement. You know, I, I've, I've had some clients, um, you know, grab like a, a light kettlebell and a PVC pipe and do a yeah. series, a series of movements. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I, I don't, it, whatever gets you moving in positions you're normally not in and, and just exerting just enough. I think that's yeah. all you got to do. Yeah. It doesn't even have time. to be super loaded. Yeah. yeah mo movement has it, light movement has sort of a tonic capability for the body. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think that's something that um, Dan John, one of my favorite strength coach authors slash authors, uh, has written about a lot uh, using using those sort of tonic sessions to restore the body, and then th those are sort of somewhat preparatory uh, for yeah. your heavier work. And I, I think we've just become too reductionist where we think it's just ah, just to handle it on the barbell. What in that one or two hours you're training per day, like three four times a week, 
that that's all the movement you're doing. You know what I mean? Like I, I would hope not. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Like I, yep. human beings, I think need more than that. You For know, a lot of people it is. Yeah. It, and that's, that's why it's like, that's why this is cool. So it's like, whether you have the PVC pipe and kettlebell or you're doing body weight, it's not going to make a difference as long as you're doing something and getting these positions outside of just training. So that's why I love it. Cause it's like, first thing when I wake up, I spend 10, 15 minutes doing it. Boom. I'm done. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. like quick little dose. And then I might do some at the end of the night. Um, uh, last few things I'll, I'll, bu I'll bust through these quicker, but I want to get your input too. gut health is extremely independent and truly optimal diets are heavily customized. This isn't really against science, but not necessarily. It's like the emerging data on the, the gut brain access is still kind of coming out. Um, but I, I think in, I guess what I'll say on this really briefly, and I actually just ordered a subscription to kind of partake in learning more about this. But anyways, I think in probably 10 to 20 years time, most people are going to have heavily customized diets, like extremely customized to the point where it's like, it's not that eggs are bad or that, you know, meat's bad or this is bad or veggies are bad. It's just that to certain people, you don't want to hit these foods. And I, I ordered a subscription to Viome. I'm not affiliated. Although admittedly, if I end up liking this, I might actually try to become affiliated. But um, I ordered a subscription to see what it's like. But essentially, they touch, test your gut health, uh, stool samples and blood samples. So probably going to poop in a tube or something. We'll see how that goes. And then they basically tell me what foods to avoid, what foods are my superfoods. And their big thing is that they try to stress that, hey, what's a superfood to someone else is not a superfood to you. And what's a bad food to someone else is not a bad food to you necessarily. You have to know based on your gut health and things like that. So I think that'll be heavily customized in the future. Yeah. What was, what was the... Um... The pricing on that too, because I'm it's really a, interested in doing that. I'm going to say, and I think people are going to be like, "What?" But like, I think it's cheap. It's two hundred dollars a month, and you can even get the first couple months at like one fifty with a discount code. And it's two hundred bucks a month, but I'm getting not just a gut test, but I'm getting um, a huge like an app telling me literally all, like a host of foods, hundreds of foods that I should eat, shouldn't eat, or can eat in moderation. And then on top of that, they also do a health intelligence test where they look at your cellular age, they look at all sorts of things going on in your body, and based on both of these tests, they give you a monthly supply of vitamins and minerals to take and a monthly supply of probiotics to take. So you're literally being sent your supplements, yeah. not having to worry about it. It's customized to your gut. You're getting guidance and, and you're getting supplements on that right. products on top of that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's definitely sure. worth it. Are, how, how often are they retesting? Every six months, which at first I thought was too infrequent. The more I think about it though, it's like, that's really not that bad. I, I do argue it could be more frequent, but that's probably the most price inducing thing because they're probably outsourcing the testing, I would guess, unless they have a lab, but I doubt it. They, they more than likely have automized everything except for the testing has to be third party. So I also they, don't know the exact timeline it would take to make a substantial change to your, your, me neither. Um, your, your, gut biome essentially real quickly too just so everyone knows basically the foods you eat have certain bacteria on them they have certain things that essentially change your gut's environment and so I, that that is that was one, my one worry is that if it's too infrequent and i don't know i don't think really many people know i'm sure there's some researcher out there i've i've dove into so many podcasts trying to get an understanding of it and i haven't had a clear-cut like expert i found that i really trust but basically um if, if every six months, if I start eating the foods they recommend, what if it pushes it and now all of a sudden it changes, you know, but at the same time, are we really going to sit here and micromanage our diets to that extent where every month or two we're dramatically changing the foods we eat? Maybe in the case of autoimmune disorders, we might need to, but I think generally speaking, it's, it seems like that's a fair pace, like every six yeah. months or so. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. And yeah. did you ever run across anyone supplementing with fecal matter? Have you heard of this? No. So, it runs so you would <laughs> I know. I'm pretty sure. I just I, picture someone taking a shit and just like reaching in the toilet. Like, <laughs> like a chocolate bar, dude. Straight up like sand. No, with the baby. it's not like that. This was, this was actually like medically supervised. I believe. And <laughs> anyway. Who the fuck sold that? No, <laughs> that listen, was like some listen. cheeky ass scientist who's like, guys, you know, it'd be really funny for this coming April Fool's Day. We're going to tell some people they got to supplement with their shit. No, 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 no. Listen. You okay. take – so this would be um, – you would basically get capsules 
<laughs> that had so imagine someone else has the gut bacteria you need you don't have it and okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. I, i'm being honest here man and, no, and, no, no. I, and I, you're I, able yeah. to basically implant that gut bacteria into your body and now that that bacteria flourishes in your body and you have now radically changed your the, the state of your gut Okay, I, I, yeah, I know. totally see how that could actually work. And I totally see how they could sterilize that and everything, everything. What I think is so funny about that, though, is I think that's the problem with, like, modern humans. Like, modernity of all kinds. Like, instead of thinking, like, how do we just change our, our intake of food? Like, it's like, let's just suffer. But it's not, it's not as simple as just that because you're being yeah. given probiotics and whatnot. So you're being given, okay, this, this I get it. mixture I get it. of this and that. And it is, um, it's just a different way of doing it. But I, I, I believe my, my older brother was talking about that at one point because he, he's like way down the rabbit hole with all sorts of, you know. Um, I, I actually, I have stuff, heard of this. Cool I totally, like it's all coming. Yeah, this, this isn't I even like, this. this isn't like some sort of like uh, weird, um, you know, like way out, way out there thing. This is legitimately like how to get a quick change. In, in someone's um, microbiome in the gut. Yeah, but no, no, of no, course no. that needs to come alongside the lifestyle changes necessary. But but I just wondered if you ever came across across anything about that. I haven't really researched or looked into it. I haven't either. I remember hearing about it years ago, actually. It's, it's been around for a little while. Yeah. And I think I laughed just as hard back then when I heard it. I'm just a child who has like really <laughs> child humor. But I, yeah, yeah, no, I have heard of that. And, and from what I remember, and I'm going off like a super hazy memory, it's actually not exactly like fecal. It's like, they extract, you know, whatever the bacteria from it or something like that, because you're right. It's like the microbiome. But I, I think what's tricky though, is like it, I think it would almost plausibly be easier to just address the diet because it'd be really I, hard yeah, to find know. the exact microbiome out there. I, from what I've understood from my limited research is that because we have immigrated so much and because food distribution has reached globalization levels where, where we're just mass producing food and sending it all around the world. And then soil health as you know, like mm -hmm. I've become obsessed with lately, but, but from all this, essentially it's dramatically fucked our gut biomes, which is why autoimmune disorders are just through the roof. I mean, Lindsay, as you know, we've talked about on our podcast deeply at yeah, Hashimoto's, I really think a lot of these autoimmune disorders, in fact, I, I think the data is really clear that a lot of it is diet related. Um, so oh, 100%. Her, 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 she has very little to no symptoms after um, correcting diet and then getting on thyroid medication. Well, and here's the weird thing, though. Scientists say that's the fix, but they don't say it's the cause. That's like the weird, they, it's like the autoimmune disorder to a lot of people in the field just, I don't know, just magically happens or something. It's just genetic or it's just whatever. But, but Chopra points out all the correlative data that like all these autoimmune disorders are just skyrocketing while like the food distribution yeah, changes. Because her, da her dad does have Hashimoto's as well. Yeah. So there is, well, yeah, there's, there's definitely, I think, genetic components for sure. But what if it's just their genetic lineage? Like whatever, you know, what is Lindsay? Is she like Irish or what is she? German. Yeah. German. Okay. So it's like in Germany generations ago, her and her father's, you know, ancestors were just eating really specific foods. That's what their gut adapted to. And then all of a sudden with the introduction of like, you know, all the worlds across the world just going like this. And we're also all of a sudden eating different foods. It's like, I know eggs really get her for instance. Yeah, it's like yeah. for whatever reason, maybe they just weren't eating that back in the day. I don't know. This point, brought worse. Yeah, it just brought work. By the way, German food is fucking amazing. It dude. is so good. Yeah. Oh, Give me some kraut and some bratwurst all day. Yeah, dude, platters that shit. Okay, um, and then last thing here, Rolly, or two two things. I'm just gonna fucking shoot these out, and then we'll move on to the next topic. Sure. Um, last thing here is programming powerlifting nuances don't matter much, but execution details do. So what I mean by that, and this is actually kind of supported by the science. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a little trickery here, but a lot of people don't know this, that in the scientific literature, it shows in the long run, not short term, 
in the long run, daily undulating periodization compared to, say, linear periodization, which is not linear progression, very different. Linear progression is what beginners do where they just try to always beat themselves and load. Linear periodization is where over the course of a training cycle, you stay in one repetition range and just linearly work your way down. So even if you have two squat days a week, you're just doing like tens on both those days. And then the next week you're doing eights and the next week you're doing sixes or whatever. And then DUP is where you have one day maybe doing higher reps, another day doing lower reps. You're changing the adaptations you're trying to train. In the short term, DUP is better elevating strength. In the long term, there seems to be a wash in results. So I don't think um, programming nuances matter quite as much as people think. Now, this doesn't mean programming doesn't matter. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, I think it hugely matters. What I'm saying is it can be fluid and there is no one style that works for everyone and it always depends on the situation. But I think more importantly, the execution of the program actually matters way more than what the program is. And this is something I never hear people talk about is like, I, I don't think people realize how bad things like overshooting are or just not paying attention to your technique when you need to be or, you know, whatever mistakes people make when executing a program. I think those are more costly than if I were to literally give a person periodization that was linear versus like DUP. You said recently you, one of your best cycles was really linear based, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't just simply because it was linear based. Yes. It was because of the visualization prior, the calling the numbers on, on target, making, um, making sure that I wasn't stepping out of the pocket, that I wasn't overshooting, mm -hmm. um, dialing in my, my recovery, my sleep, and my, my nutrition, surrounding all that stuff. Uh, that's what made it beneficial. There could have, you know, ultimately a lifter can progress with a variety of training styles. Yeah. But what's most important is that they believe in it and that they attack it yes and that they attack oh, all yeah, the variables yeah. outside of it too yeah because if they're just kind of checking the box on training if they're just like oh well what do i have to do today okay i'll go i'll do this and i'll do that you know versus someone who opens up their training and says you know and this is the day before or something like okay what, what am i doing tomorrow all right what did i do in an equivalent session last week okay refer back to the notes from the previous week Make a plan about how, a plan of attack. Okay, tomorrow, I'm I'm gonna take down this number on this on 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 this. I'm gonna do this 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 this. Kind of list that out, right? Plan out some warm up sets. Uh, visualize what they're about to do, and then the next day, then go and actually execute that plan with small deviations based on what they need to do that day. Uh, that's going to be far more productive, and and you can do that with a variety of different training styles. But that that belief and that intensity of effort need to be there. I don't mean intensity of effort as like overreaching. I just mean the, the mental intensity of, of being mm -hmm. focused on the task of executing that plan. I, I think you see this at the highest level of powerlifting. A lot of them have different approaches to their training. There's vastly different approaches to programming, yet they're all high level. Are we really thinking it's just only genetics? I think what you'll find is, yeah, genetics they have in common. The other thing they have in common is good execution. You rarely see high level lifters, especially at their best, um, you know, poorly executing a program. And then likewise, it's like when they do, you usually see them hit plateaus. There's a, a few that come to mind that just like plateau for a year or two straight. I've done this, you know, where you're just poorly executing. So I, I actually totally agree with that. I think execution just matters so much more. And it's funny because everyone's obsessed with what programming, like what are your programming secrets, blah, blah, blah. But like, they're so not obsessed with how to become and develop themselves into a good athlete. And if more people took that part seriously, you would see people gaining way faster. Well, the, the problem is people are seeking what's the better program. Yep, what's yep. more, what's the more secret. optimal? I know I made progress on this, but what's more optimal than that? Mm -hmm. Truth be told, the the road to the biggest lifts that you're going to ever have is going to be paved with boring ass sessions that you need to intensely execute with, mm -hmm. with, with focus. And you need to and then go home the other 22 hours of the day and execute that shit. Yep. With exactly. Focus. Yeah. It, it's funny if, if people spent less time looking at what program and more time looking at what better they could do with their sleep, nutrition, whatever. And the stupid thing is everyone thinks, and then I tell them, Hey, go track your sleep data. You're the one who got me into all that. And, and then they're like, Oh fuck. I didn't realize how shitty my sleep was. I'm like, there you go. I'm like, Hey, go track this track that, you know, and those yeah. are, 
are the things people need to focus and straight on. up you don't want it if you're not doing that stuff if yeah. someone's listening to this and they don't do that stuff, if they don't track sleep, if they don't track nutrition, and then they're beating their chest in the gym saying, oh, like, I'm going to take these lifts down. You know, I care so much. Powerlifting is my life. You know, no, it's not. Nope. That's the story you tell yourself. That's, <laughs> that's the story you tell yourself. That's, that's, the, that's the image that you want to portray to other people because that's your identity that you've developed for yourself, but you're not really living it until you dial that stuff in. And that's not me speaking negatively saying, you know, trying to talk down to someone. I'm trying to encourage you to take the steps to actually realize those goals. And you'd be surprised what you can do if you, if you actually put that work in. But what I was, what I was saying earlier about how boring that process can be is because when you, you find something that works well enough, meaning like you made progress, you made some sort of like Mm -hmm. significant progress. Okay, cool. Don't just radically change things. That doesn't mean training can't be fluid like we were discussing earlier. Mm -hmm. It's going to ebb and flow and there's a time and a place to go through this type of phase and that type of phase. But don't entirely just toss everything out just because you you got sold on, you know, this shiny new program that you think is going to give you all the keys. Right. Well, and and is it really boring? Like it like I know what you're saying. It's not boring to me or you. Exactly. And that's how that's how we got where we are. But exactly. to other people, it can become boring. Well, and, and the f- thing is, it's it's how much you give yourself. Into, if you truly adopt it, it's not boring because it's it's exciting. It's like you're in the process. You're living it. Yeah. The, the worst hell you can ever do to yourself is think that your program is like the keys to your success and nothing else outside of that matters. And then so all you do is you just like rely on the program. Don't check your other shit. And then eight weeks, the program works well. And then the next 12 weeks after that, you're plateaued and you just fall off. And you, everything goes to shit. That's the worst thing you can do. Like at the end of the day, the boring shit is actually the fun shit. It's a paradox. It really is. I find when I truly invest myself, that's what I've been doing lately. And my training is just fucking taking off right now. And it's because I'm invested in my sleep, my execution of the program, all the quote unquote boring shit. But it's actually really fun doing it like that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the goal is to hone the process, find something that works for you, make small tweaks, run it again, make small tweaks, run it again. Yeah. And yeah. Not to just toss everything out. I, it, it, it makes me so annoyed when, when someone will, you know, you have re- lifters reach out to you. Oh, I, just, I just feel like I want to switch it up. I want to yeah, switch yeah, it up yeah, yeah. just because, um, you know, I'm just kind of sick of doing this one exercise. And, and now, now that's not to say that there isn't, benefit to using another variation there but i don't want to make programming changes just because just simply because someone's like well i'm just kind of bored you know i've been doing i've been doing pause squats for like a month so i think i'm kind of done and i'm like you pause squat like 225 (laughs) <laughs> so pounds so well, like why, why don't it's between adaptation run and stales we know it does because it's fluid but and and someone just never having actually adapted and gone yeah. through the 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 motions every day made very little progress or maybe they've even somehow made progress just off of, off of dumb luck but then they're like i'm just kind of like boy, i just need something new it's like no you don't give into the process some more yeah just like lean in bro you, just you, a little you, bit more you got a guy who's pause squatting 225 for reps and he's like man i'm kind of bored with this i just don't want to really do pause squats anymore get to pause squatting 405 and we can swap it out <laughs> You know yep. what I mean? Like, because the only way you're going to get better at some of these things is by training them. Right. Yep. You know, I've referenced incline bench in the past when I, when I sucked at it and I was like, Hey, I'm going to get better at this. So I'm going to prioritize this until I'm good enough to do something else. Right. Yeah. 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 And, you, and, and uh, like you said, that's not boring to you or me, but that's the difference. So for the people who really want to go the long, the long haul, uh, they, they've got to find uh, excitement in the nuances and the little wins and the little, the little things along the way, you know, totally. instead of saying, man, oh, I've got more squats, bench and, benches and deadlifts to do. It's, it's glass half full versus glass half empty. You know, it's, oh my God, I, I can't wait to get back in there because I made, I made such progress last week with my tech, technical execution of the squat. I can't wait to apply that today think a little less about it and perform a little better, you know? Yep. 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 Precisely, man. I'm with it, dude. This has been a good one. I think we'll save the next question for next time because we're getting up here on the time. Uh, But this is a great, you know, time back uh, after your surgery. Yeah. Good to be back in a week. Let's do it. 
Sounds good to me. They, they they hear it now on YouTube. So <laughs> it's coming back out in a week unless I'm I in. fuck up, but I'm not going to fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. Comment down below. I always forget to say this. Let me get a comment, like, do all that stuff. Everyone tell Dylan, uh, thank you for coming back on, and we'll catch you guys in the next one. See you guys.